um, so many people are feeling disheartened um, and some of the chilling effect is working because that's what it's there to do. It's to try and stop people feeling that they can have a voice and that they should have a voice. I mean, speaking personally, I have to think, you know, three, four, five times for agreeing to come on this platform. And I have to um, reach into my own courage every time. It's not always an easy choice. Um, it's, not, it's just this last week um, since I spoke at the last Palestine demo that I have been called, you know, in a national uh, newspaper, The Telegraph, uh, somebody who is a threat to multiracial Britain. You know, I have my words deliberately smeared and misrepresented um, on a regular basis every time I speak out uh, uh, on this issue. So it's a commitment I have to make time and time again. And I feel hugely privileged to join this platform. The people have already spoken. And of course, um, you know, we're here, we're waiting to hear Elan and Norman, who have made huge sacrifices simply because they have been championing freedom of speech, not just for themselves, but importantly for those who have been silenced and dispossessed the Palestinian people. So this is not an academic um, argument anymore, if I can uh, uh, use that analogy. Um, I think for many people on the panel and in the audience, this has now become very personal because our own um, freedoms to speak up uh, ha have been compromised, are being pushed back. I, I was always proud to join uh, the anti-war movement, you know, it shows my age way back in, in 2002, when we were extending our solidarity, using the freedom of speech we have in this country to speak up for those who didn't have uh, the same voice, whether it was in Afghanistan or Iraq. Right now, that battle, that censorship, that silencing, um, that occupation of political space, if I may say, you know, has come to us in this country. You know, many people here will know the, the kind of history of this country, but one of the things we can be proud of is that um, whilst, you know, we know about the history of colonization and imperialism, in this country, we have enjoyed freedoms to speak up. It's been called the mother of democracy because it has delivered to some extent, you know, uh, forms of democracy, which other countries have been envious of. And yet these are the very freedoms that, that are now under attack. So actually, unless we all speak up now and forcefully and confidently and unapologetically, um, we will actually be silenced um, forevermore. That's what I believe is at stake. And I agree totally with Moshe when he says there's good news and bad news. The fact that we are on this back foot at the moment, the fact that we have come under such attack, I believe is actually a result of the fact that we have managed as a movement to put those who champion settlement, who champion occupation, who champion division on the back foot. And that's why we have to expect and we have to gird ourselves, friends, for, for an even more vicious backlash. Jeremy Corbyn was ignored for many years when he wasn't seen as a threat. But when he became leader of the Labour Party, he was saying nothing different from what he said for the last 30, uh, over 30 years. But because he, he was becoming close to power, close to taking um, government, when the results of 2017 came in, a vicious witch hunt was launched. And we've seen the effects of that to the point that now former leader of the biggest um, party in Europe ha still has his whip removed. That's where we've got to. So we're, we're up against some very, very real forces. And we've seen now that push against academics like David Miller, and we've heard about others. People are now being made emblematic trophies. Corbyn has been picked out on purpose to deter any other politicians from talking about Palestinian rights, from criticizing Israel. Everybody on this call knows it's not about anti-Semitism or anti-racism. It's about Israeli impunity. It's about a political program. And I will say it is not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel, just as it is not Islamophobic to criticize regimes like Saudi Arabia. But that conflation has been deliberately and mendaciously introduced in order to silence um, the very um, opposition and standing up for humanity that we're seeing. And they're on the back foot, why? Because actually this new generation, even before the huge mobilizations that we've seen very recently, a new generation has woken up. It started with a great anti-war movement when we saw the largest protest movement in human history, not just here in the UK, but across the world, where people came together to say, not in my name, standing in solidarity with the Iraqi people who were being bombed under false pretenses, that the issue of Palestine became something um, people became more aware about. But this new generation, just as with climate change, just as with um, 
uh, the, the, the links between the economy, um, Deepa very profoundly sh showed the links with neoliberalism, what's happening here. There is, I believe, also a similar link with imperialism. And young people are standing up and saying, not in our name. Young people's trajectory is towards progressiveness. And that's what's frightening the old guard more and more, which is why they are becoming more and more vicious and using the, the levers of power that they have to deny the democracy, to deny voice, to deny agency, and to bring in dis dis disillusionment um, and, and a feeling of apathy and powerlessness whilst driving down economic progress to keep people poor, to keep people divided, to keep people having away from any space to even think about what freedom, what political rights, what human rights and what solidarity, what solidarity can mean. So whilst I'm not naive at all about the, the pressures and the challenges we have, I actually feel optimistic for the longer, longer term. I know that history is on our side and just as um, African, uh, there's a slavery that Africans were subjected to, just as the apartheid regime in my living memory, um, these will become, um, the, the Israeli apartheid regime, I believe in its present form, will become a footnote in history um, within, within the next generation, if not the generation after. But we have a battle right now where people are being silenced because those people can see that trajectory. So we have to stay firm. You know, I'm reminded of, <laughs> I mean, it may sound like a specious analogy, you know, um, with, uh, with the Lord of the Rings, where it's, you've got, you've got to hold that door, guys. You know, we're at that point, but, but, but the, the, the real victory is in sight and we have to keep making those hard sacrifices, but we're not alone. And that's the message I really want people to take away from very, three very simple practical steps. You know, I don't need to analyze you know, how bad things are here to this audience. Number one, keep speaking up and keep asking for and demanding freedom of speech, not just for people who agree with us. And that's why I perhaps may go further than some of the speakers so far. I think it's the left and those who are progressive who get most silenced by any laws which um, talk about um, curtailing freedom of speech. I think we have nothing to be afraid of. Let's bring out any ideas. I feel confident about challenging the real racists, but let us push back. And I think we need a coalition wider than just a pro-Palestinian solidarity movement, wider than the left. There are people on the right who are also worried about the, these so-called culture wars, whether it's around issues around um, transgenderism, about feminism. There are many, many people who are feeling silenced uh, and driven out of public space. And we don't have to take a position on those issues. I think we have to take a position of allowing freedom of discussion and debate and freedom to get things wrong and to make mistakes. That's what being human is about, that we can then learn and challenge. And you know, people in academia, whether it's at the university level or it's at primary school level, whether it's um, in secondary school or even in the home as parents, surely part of nurturing the next generation is about being able to debate ideas, question, learn, make mistakes, and grow a punitive censorship silencing and removing freedom of speech can never end up in anything good and i think that's that's the direction we're going down and i think we can have more allies than at present number two when it comes to lobbying the government do so forcefully do so collectively we have important petitions going in to sanction israel just as we've had for other regimes you know whether it's saudi arabia in the present or, or South Africa in the past. We must, again, stop apologizing and say that our government's um, in, involvement, the reason I'm going on about Israel, because it's my taxes, which are being used to fund those um, weapons going out from this country to enable the occupation um, to go on. So where our uh, voice as citizens is important, as well as, of course, the historical linkage Britain has to this very issue. But for me, it's a very concrete reality. Um, right now, Palestinians are being killed, tortured, maimed with weapons being made in this country we have a moral and an economic case to say not in our name which brings me to the third point about direct action i congratulate those people who are not waiting around for the governments to take action we are living in democracy so i'm saying let's lobby let's petition let's you know get the mps to speak up but also let's not wait around for them to do the right thing uh, and that's why those actions whether it's in the albert factories in sheffield in leicester where people are highlighting actually how these things are being made here and going out we must make it unpleasant and um, not so easy for people to be making profit at the expense uh, of innocent people. And by doing so, a precedent is set um, uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and so there are many things that we can do. We are not uh, um, 
disempowered here. We still have a voice here in the UK, probably greater than many other um, people in other parts of the world. So whilst we are under attack, whilst it is difficult now, I mean, I, I have a fantastic job in the NHS, which I love, and I'm all about reducing health inequalities day in, day out. And a part of me has to question, do I come on platforms like this? Because I know that I will get pressure in that job. I'll have people coming out to try and silence me in so many ways. So we have to make these difficult choices. But I think I cannot be about addressing inequalities in my hometown, in my country, if I'm not prepared to stand up and speak about inequalities anywhere. And I just want to leave you with two quotes, one which I have to reflect on as a Muslim very regularly and which continues to inspire me. It's a verse from the Quran, um, chapter 4, verse 135, which I remind myself of as soon as I start to lose uh, a bit of courage or hope. Stand up for justice even if it goes against yourself, your family, kith or kin, rich or poor. And for me, that's very deep and profound because it's not about standing for justice because just because it suits you. Sometimes there's a price to pay for standing for justice. It's not easy. And my final quote would be from Martin Luther King, who I know is quoted always, but I came across this quite recently and, and, and it really speaks to me at this time. Our lives begin to end the day we stay silent about things that matter. Our lives begin to end the day we stay silent about things that matter. So thank you for everyone on this call. Join the campaign for free speech, sign up, keep speaking up, take courage for one another. We are not alone, they are few, we are the many. Thank you.